Welcome to our program. Uh, the day before the New York and the Connecticut primary tomorrow, we bring you an important show. Our guests include Senator Ted Kennedy, who is with us. Uh, later on in the show, you will meet Robert Strauss, who is President Carter's national campaign chairman. At the end of the program, for fairness reasons, we bring you a representative of uh, presidential candidate uh, LaRouche. So stay with us. This is an important show, the day before a day when I want you to all go and vote. Yes. The answer is yes. We do have to have a little bit of LaRouche at the end of the show. He's on the ballot in Connecticut. Our first guest today, I'm happy and proud to introduce, is Senator Ted Kennedy. Welcome to our show. Well, I'm delighted to have a chance to be on the show. We've heard a lot about it. You really did? <laughs> a little about it. A little. All right, fine. Let's, uh, one never knows. I don't knows. have a chance at noontime to, to watch the show. I rarely see it myself. But, that's but I nice. heard a lot, uh, a lot of Thank good you. About it. A lot of good things about you. Well, I, want, I have been following the campaign really closely. As I told you in the, the green room before the show, my father has been a committeeman, and so all my life I've had a lifelong interest in politics. So um, at this point, I'm, the first thing I'm curious about is how actually do you feel? Without question, things are not yeah. going well. How do you feel at this point, psychologically, physically, about what you put in and where you have to go if you stay in this thing all the way? Well, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very hopeful about the outcome of the uh, New York uh, primary. New York is, of course, an enormous important state, not only because of the number of delegates that it uh, will send to the Democratic National Convention, but also because it uh, really, in many respects, is the heart of the uh, Democratic right. Party. It has a very uh, proud uh, tradition of members of the Democratic Party that have played a role in, in national politics. And I believe the people in New York are issue-oriented, as they are in Connecticut. Uh, they care about a candidate standing on uh, particular uh, issues. And I've tried over the course of the campaign to speak to both uh, uh, domestic issues and foreign policy issues. Yeah. Uh, I've tried to put forward a, uh, an effective program to deal with uh, inflation by imposing a, a freeze on, on prices. But it's, um, it's been a, uh, it's a long process, the selection process. It's a valuable one. I think uh, a campaign should not only be a candidate speaking uh, about uh, his or her positions, but also getting some response back. Mm -hmm. You learn a lot about uh, the country. Would, would you say, at this, how would you def define the difference between the, the Illinois voters and the, and the New York voters? And Illinois being the big Midwest industrial state, and here we are in New York. Is there a perceivable difference, and why do you think you might be able to do better here than, than in Illinois? Well, I think, uh, first of all, there's probably a, uh, a more uh, a dramatic difference between probably uh, New York and, and Maine, New Hampshire, and also uh, Iowa. Uh, let alone some of the caucus uh, states of Oklahoma and uh, some of the other uh, states. I think the, uh, the people here, first of all, have uh, newspapers that are widely uh, read and that are, some are very issue-oriented, uh, the uh, television programs, people are interested. There's a, a very uh, substantial cultural uh, aspect in the, in the quality of the life of the people mm -hmm. in this uh, area. It's a great sports town. Um, I think people feel strongly about politics, sports. Um, you never rooted for the Yankees, though, did you, when you were growing <laughs> no. up? Oh, no. The, uh, <laughs> the Red it was Sox. always the Red Sox, but uh, it always seems that the Yankees come up a little... Uh, the, the, Yankee, uh, the Red Sox do well about, until about the middle of August, but next year we're going to get you. No, well, maybe this year your <laughs> candidacy will be like the Yankees. Well, that's uh, all right if we think of it in some years. Uh, uh, well, I'll, uh, I'll betting on the red side. Now, I'd like to go. I'd like to go back um, to the beginning of your campaign and ask you something I've wondered about. In your mind, because if, and people now are looking at your campaign, it started here and it, now it's at this point. People will say the Roger Mudd interview was was not good. It wasn't. It was a, it was a bad thing at the beginning. In your mind, what went wrong during that interview? When you flash back to it, how do you remember feeling? People. You know what I mean? Well, I'm uh, really not as uh, interested in talking about the uh, the past as the uh, the present. No, I, and the I recognize that, but but I suppose maybe there there's are some a couple clarity of different uh, uh, elements in, in looking back. Uh, uh, first of all, I wasn't prepared during that interview to make my announcement for the uh, the presidency, in spite of a good mm -hmm. deal of uh, probing. And I think if if uh, one's mind is just about made up, and you're asked a good many uh, questions about whether you're going to be a candidate or not, and you're your mind is just about made up, trying to, to give a responsive answer, and yet also not to declare for the presidency, uh, does uh, uh, communicate sort at least a, some a kind double, of a communication yeah. uh, a problem. Secondly, um, I suppose that uh, I uh, and members of my family still place a, 
a very uh, a high value on some degree of uh, privacy. Uh, and I think uh, most people put a value on it. And I suppose that uh, in any kind of, uh, of interview, when uh, you're asked about matters affecting uh, relationships with your right. or wife, or uh, that there is a certain amount of uh, hesitancy and being willing to uh, share those kinds of uh, uh, either emotions or feelings. I think uh, it doesn't mean that one doesn't have that, but it means that uh, you're prepared to share it with your uh, wife and with your children sure. or with close and valued friends and perhaps not a television um, uh, audience. But I, uh, I, I believe that, uh, quite frankly, that uh, we're, uh, uh, I look really to the future. And oh, absolutely. The, uh, I, but after hearing the response to that, I, I often wondered, you know, I, I felt there, there was, had to be a reason for it. And I think there's some value in, in saying what you just said, that your mind can be in one point, you can be not certain what you're doing, as well as to be a little <laughs> bit shocked by what people are asking you. And I th frequently think that we expect our candidates to be always like supermen in all positions. And when they do falter, we hone in on them so scrupulously, and uh, that, that was always what I felt was happening sure. there, you know. Uh, why, how do you explain to yourself at this point the, f the failure of your candidacy to ignite, mm -hmm. to, to really capture the imaginations of, of the people? Now, maybe it's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> and if it happens tomorrow, f in 48 hours, this question is, right. is no longer valid. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? Well, I think there's always a... Um, uh, uh, you know, a number of challenges, and you run for the, uh, uh, the presidency. Some you have uh, control over, some uh, you don't. Um, I uh, firmly believe the reasons for running for the presidency are more evident today than at the time that I announced. With the I problems. agree with that. Why Secondly, don't people, why, this may yeah. interrupt for a second, but why, I, I think that's a good point. Yes. Why, why haven't the voters focused on that from, from your standpoint? That, well, to, from, to elaborate from, uh, on the original question. Uh, yeah. My standpoint, I think that uh, American people still have a very deep concern for the well-being and the freedom of the uh, hostages, for example. There's a sense of national unity. There was a period of time during, for a couple of months, that uh, uh, no candidate, Republican or myself, could make any comments about the handling of foreign policy because it might be interpreted as being undermining mm -hmm. Uh, what uh, may or may not be going on in terms of negotiations to release uh, the hostages. Um, and yet uh, we find uh, now we can talk about uh, the failure of the administration and its handling of the right. UN resolution. It's, it's fair to talk about inc uh, the, uh, the incompetency in, t in terms of uh, the uh, foreign policy of, uh, of Mr. Cotter and undermining a relationship with the state of uh, Israel. Uh, but you couldn't uh, really sort of talk of even about the incompetency in handling a Cuban situation where Soviet troops are in Cuba and Mr. Carter would say right. uh, that that is unacceptable and then three weeks later Accept say it's it. acceptable, yeah. which I think sent an important message to the Soviet Union about uh, whether they could or, not, or should not invade Afghanistan because I don't think that they took the warnings of an American president seriously after that. So, uh, but we were effectively a stop from from talking about uh, those matters. But let me say this, uh, I don't uh, question that I in these beginnings of a presidential campaign, there's always startup time. It takes a time for, I think, a candidate to uh, best understand uh, how he or she can uh, get a, a message across, uh, and communicate well and right. effectively. And uh, I suppose uh, that was true in the campaigns that I was involved in with uh, my brothers, and it's tr it was Does true about mine. Does take startup time. The, the polls would indicate a surprising thing. They would in, well, the polls would indicate that there's a high degree of, of mistrust of you. I'm sure you're aware of this. Yes. Right. What, why are people perceiving you that way? What, what have you failed to do? What c would you like to do right now to try some of that? Well, uh, the, uh, the fact of the, uh, the matter is, you, uh, you know, you can't uh, just say uh, to trust people, me. trust me. No, I, I, mean, I understand that. That, uh, that can't uh, be uh, just achieved. Uh, what I do take some satisfaction from is having served in the United States Senate for 17 years, represented the people of Massachusetts. Uh, the people of that state uh, know me very well. I uh, spend uh, time in, in their homes and in the plants and the factories. I talk to people on the street corners. I, um, I've been close to uh, the people of that state, which I've been honored to uh, represent. And those people uh, know me. and. Uh, they uh, know, I believe, the 
sense of commitment to public service, that I still view it as an honorable profession, that I'm in public life because I think an individual can make a difference, and that I believe very deeply in the things in which have brought me into this campaign and which I want to try and achieve as a President of the United States. And uh, there may be uh, people who differ on particular positions, mm -hmm. but I think that they have a sense of value for my service. And I do believe that as the campaign goes on, that uh, people in other parts of the country will get uh, to uh, that point of view as well. It does take time, but uh, clearly I'm, I'm very hopeful that can be achieved. Let's take a break for a Bye. commercial, and we'll be back with Senator Kennedy right after this. We don't dwell Welcome. We're back with uh, Senator Ted Kennedy. Uh, the Iranian government has asked for an apology from the United yeah. States government. This is uh, something, I can't remember too many other precedents in history for something <laughs> like this. President Carter says, no, we will not apologize for our relationship with the Shah in the past. Do you agree with that standpoint? If you were president, uh, given the exact same circumstances right now, would you say, okay, we apologize? How no. do you feel about it? You would not? No. No, I uh, still haven't lost hope that with the establishment of the uh, commission to consider uh, the grievances of the Iranian people against uh, the Shah, that that uh, somehow can be resurrected to the point of view as to be the instrument by which the hostages would be uh, released. I haven't lost hope. It's difficult for me to believe that the, the commission would be named, that mm -hmm. it would meet, consider the grievances, and that we didn't have some kind of arrangement for the release of the hostages. But I still have hope that that uh, commission uh, will be the instrument for the release of the hostages. I don't think that we should restrict uh, the uh, Commission to examine all the grievances against the Shah and let it lead to wherever it might. Right. But uh, I wouldn't be uh, prepared to um, uh, admit uh, to any uh, uh, guilt um, uh, prior to the, any uh, findings of uh, fact uh, by the Commission itself. Is there anything that you feel should be done today, tomorrow? with regard to getting the hostages back that the President is not doing? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm still hopeful that, the, uh, that they'll be released and released uh, soon. I, I do believe that uh, the uh, commission idea had been initially suggested by Bonnie Sada last fall, and we basically ignored it, and then it was reintroduced by Kurt Waldheim in January and rejected. Uh, then uh, uh, I had made uh, the, the statement and comment that um, that it should be reconsidered, and I was welcome the fact that it is being uh, used as an instrument now. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, perhaps if it, uh, in an earlier period of time, it may have just sprung the lock for the release of the hostages. We won't obviously know that until the hostages are returned. Nor will we know the degree of warning that uh, Mr. Carter had about the danger to the lives of the Americans That's in true. Tehran until yeah. the hostages are released. And those matters will, of course, be given a good deal of review. Let, let's, move in, let's move into another area. You are, are aware of uh, the fact that ma many people, when they perceive you, perceive you as a, a man who uh, would not do well <coughs> under pressure. This is a, sort of the man on the street thing. If they've got, if they got a rap on you, that's, that's one rap that they say. And I, I suppose it's coming primarily out of the Chappaquiddick uh, incident. Uh, how, how do you feel about the fact that given the intense media focus, which is on, on everybody in public life these days, that the Chappaquiddick thing is probably never going to go away. That there always will be somebody who is, you know, pushing it in center stage when your name is, is mentioned. Vis-a-vis right. -vis your ability to handle a crisis coolly, calmly, and in the way that one would want a president of the United States to handle a crisis. Well, you've got a lot of uh, yeah. questions Two, th two or three things in there. That, but uh, first of all, let me uh, say that I've uh, accepted uh, responsibility uh, for that tragedy which occurred 11 years ago. It was a, an accident. Um, uh, I knew that when I announced for the presidency of the United States uh, that uh, there would be, uh, that this issue would be raised. I talked uh, this matter over with the members of my uh, family because it was obviously a face. Yeah. Uh, our whole uh, uh, family. But uh, I felt uh, strongly that uh, having assumed and accepted the uh, responsibility and knowing that there weren't going to be any uh, new uh, facts that were going to come out, and there haven't been, uh, other than uh, those in which I have uh, already spoken to, 
uh, and testified to, I felt that, uh, that the reasons for running outweigh the reasons not to run. Mm -hmm. I, I care very deeply about the matters in which uh, brought me into public life and which I continue uh, to be committed to. Now, the question about how one uh, responds to uh, the issues of pressure, uh, I, I think it's a fair uh, to uh, review uh, the kinds of uh, pressures that uh, either that I have been under over the period of my lifetime. I had a yeah, rather a unique uh, experience and uh, my life has been touched by uh, tragedy and by violence uh, that is uh, known to certainly your uh, yeah. listening audience. Um, and I have, uh, uh, in any, every one of those uh, circumstances, have uh, faced up to uh, responsibilities and have uh, been committed to carrying forward and carrying on and continued my commitment to uh, both public service and the public good. And I uh, believe that uh, it's uh, fair to look at uh, the performance over a, a considerable period of time, find out whether uh, this has been uh, the performance of a person that has uh, measured up and uh, would uh, be able to uh, accept uh, those uh, responsibilities. And the fact is, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that I could. Uh, I believe uh, deeply in the things in which have brought me to public life, and I'm absolutely convinced that I could discharge the responsibilities of the presidency and uh, deal effectively with the principal challenges which are before this country. Have you ever uh, publicly addressed yourself to the question of how you have changed as a result of having gone through that one yes. specific tragedy of Chappaquiddick. I mean, we all face tragedies in our lives. We all have been involved in doing things we wish hadn't happened. And uh, some people face them and learn something from them and grow. And other people, you know, repeat the same patterns over and over and over again for the rest of their lives. Right. Now, this has obviously been something that has given you tremendous grief that haunts you still but nevertheless, it's also given you an opportunity to change. How would you say you've changed as a result of that? Well, the, the uh, responsibility uh, for uh, the tragedy obviously remains with me every day I know. of my life. But uh, obviously, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the fact of bearing uh, that uh, responsibility and knowing that uh, has uh, an effect on one's uh, outlook towards life, one's values, one's beliefs. It uh, obviously has a, a deepening uh, uh, impact in one's life, and uh, I'm a very different person now than I was prior to the time of that uh, tragedy 11 years ago. It was 11 years ago. Yeah. And uh, How would you since say that, that you 11 years, uh, I think uh, both the work in the United States Senate in the areas of, of uh, human uh, compassion and uh, concern, um, I'd like to believe that I've been a leader in the United States Senate in those uh, areas of, of uh, trying to, to improve the basic uh, quality of life of people, uh, whether it has been in, in health care or decent education or decent housing or decent job or the environment or trying to avoid nuclear confrontation or trying to avoid uh, uh, the, the move towards a nuclear power generally. I'd like to believe that uh, I've been a, a constructive force, mm -hmm. not that everyone would have to agree on it, but I think uh, we've tried to make the use of both the opportunity in the Senate. Right. Let's take another break Good. for a commercial and continue with Senator Kennedy right after this. We're back with Senator Kennedy. After, after all that uh, you and your family have been through, the whole range of, of tragedies that we all know about, the next generation, your children and your two brothers' children, are they as committed to public life and, and public service as, as you and your three brothers were, and, and your, as well as your sisters? Well, I, I would uh, hope so. I don't think it's uh, necessary that they, uh, they run for public office, but yeah. I would certainly uh, hope that they would devote their energies and their interests and their enthusiasm and their abilities towards improving the quality of life for, uh, uh, for members of our society. Uh, the members of my chose elective office, but I'm uh, enormously, uh, I, I recognize the enormous contribution that individuals make in improving the quality of life, of working with uh, the handicapped or the retarded or the work that nurses or doctors uh, make uh, in terms of their uh, community, the other community service of people. I think it's just uh, very important that uh, this uh, generation, the next generation, is going to be involved in uh, using their energies and their uh, abilities towards uh, 
uh, doing something for other people. That's a tradition which I come from. Uh, I think this country has uh, been uh, extremely uh, good to the members of our family. I think we've had uh, successes and, and uh, tragedies, but uh, I'm basically a very hopeful and optimistic person, and I would hope that uh, these, uh, this next generation would be active. Who is doing what in your campaign? And <laughs> they all seem to be what doing everything. success? <laughs> <laughs> they all seem to be yeah, doing I everything. I saw a picture they of Ted, what, your son, yes, was in the paper right. the other day. Who, right. wh what are, where are they now? Well, they, they, all, uh, uh, they are all over uh, both uh, New York and uh, uh, Connecticut. Uh, young uh, Ted has uh, just come back. To, uh, he was actually uh, worked very hard in, in the early primary states, and he uh, w was, had an opportunity to go out and participate in the handicapped skiers race out in Colorado and do a little campaigning out there. It was amazing he, how fast he learned to ski with and, one leg. Uh, it was he a, did uh, very well. It seemed well, like yeah. one day he was in the hospital, and almost yes. five months later he was on skis. Well, the... Uh, uh, his stories about uh, how these um, other young people, these other children, the blind, uh, those who have lost uh, uh, two limbs, um, uh, have um, take to uh, both sports and athletics is really um, inspiring. Yeah. My um, daughter's uh, now making good uh, speeches. The uh, Robert Kennedy children have been very, uh, very active and they're very um, articulate, very concerned. Uh, um, so they're they're very uh, and my. Uh, nieces are very much involved. Uh, my uh, niece Kathleen uh, Townsend has mm -hmm. really organized uh, all of the environmental uh, issues in the course of our campaign and is a very talented uh, young lawyer. So uh, they're, they're active and they're interested and, that's, uh, and it's fun to be with them. They're, that's good. They're, uh, they're you you, you, you watch life. over an enormous amount of children. I mean, you, you are the godfather for an enormous amount of children. Uh, what, shift, let's shift to the opposition. I mean, the, the Republican <laughs> opposition at this point. What kind of a threat do you see Reagan as being? How formidable a candidate c could he be as a national candidate? Well, uh, clearly he's been very uh, uh, successful in the course of the Republican uh, primaries. Um, I think he's an uh, odds-on favorite uh, now to gain yeah. uh, the Republican nomination. I think Mr. Anderson, is, uh, Congressman Anderson, has done... Um, exceedingly well. He did very well in my own state of Massachusetts, and, and uh, as well as uh, George Bush, who I've known over a period of time. So I let the Republicans really take care of their own problems. I'm no, just I'm just curious how you perceive Reagan as a, a potential national candidate. If you are successful, yes. you will have to go up against uh, right. probably uh, Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Um, do you think he can be elected? Do you, well, I don't. Everyone uh, says he, does, he couldn't really be elected. Yes, you know? but uh, the uh, I don't um, underestimate uh, the. Uh, uh, the abilities or the, uh, the capabilities of any of those who've uh, uh, been uh, tried and tested through that primary process. And um, as, uh, I think uh, they'll, the Republicans will feel a strong, um, a strong candidate. Uh, the interesting point is, is that I think uh, the Republicans are really capturing the imagination of the American people with the course of the debates that they had. Right. They had very um, uh, articulate, uh, a spokesman who expressed views on a variety of different issues. They had uh, some good uh, diversity, but clearly they've attracted both a lot of attention and a lot of interest. Uh, the Democratic Party has been denied that opportunity for the refusal of the president He's to in the, the engage Rose Garden in the, strategy, yeah. uh, with the debate, and particularly on matters that would have had a very direct effect on New York, for example, these budget cuts. I mean, why don't the people of New York entitled to the figures on the budget cuts prior to the time of the primary. Right. Well, why does Mayor Koch come out at this point endorsing President Carter? Uh, and on the other hand, you're criticizing Pre President Carter. Why was Koch able to get that Carter, uh, rather Carter, able to get the Koch endorsement? Well, I suppose it goes, uh, the best one to ask there is uh, Mayor Koch. Yeah. But, uh, clearly, uh, what the, uh, the cuts are going to mean, uh, a substantial reduction of services, summer jobs, education, uh, health services for the city, seem to me to have been wiser to make up the uh, differences in the budget deficit by increasing the windfall profits tax rather mm -hmm. than reducing the services to New York City that is already extremely yeah. hard pressed, facing uh, the fact that uh, half of the youth that attend the public schools uh, drop out and there's an army of unemployed youths in the uh, city of uh, New York. Lisa, that type of, uh, unrest. Uh, that type of uh, a choice, mm -hmm. you see, should have been presented to the people. Uh, of New York. Well, will you explain briefly, uh, we don't have too much time left, <laughs> right. but briefly on the wage and price controls. You're the only candidate who is, is coming out for wage price controls. President Carter said, no, it's never worked right. in the past. Why do you think it would work? And how, well, you know, simply sure. would it work? Simply uh, a freeze on prices, interest rates, um, 
uh, rents, dividends, uh, wages right across uh, the board would reduce the rate of inflation probably two-thirds or three-quarters in one month. In the early 1970s, that's just what happened. When you had in place the freeze, I put in place the kinds of economic policies that would bring the economy back to the type of productivity, productivity that we had 20 years ago. We're zero rate of productivity at, uh, at the present time. Strengthen the forces of competition, foreign trade, and then gradually take the, uh, the controls uh, off. Uh, that really is the only fair way. Mr. Carter raises gasoline 10 cents a, uh, which, a gallon. Which fuels inflation. Which right? fuel, uh, fuels inflation and budget cuts, which will impact the people of uh, New York City. And the fact remains, if we're serious about dealing with inflation, we have to take the strong measures so that everyone across the board is going to bear the burden, and not just of the people, the working people, uh, the uh, middle-income people, uh, the elderly people. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, the fundamental issue. You have, uh, at least according to what I've read in other interviews with you, you feel that President Carter, ultimately, the time is going to run out on President Carter in terms of the, the public, the voters perceiving where he really is. Well, you see, the presidency doesn't belong to Jimmy Carter. It belongs to the American people. And uh, the, no president is above the American people. And you can't answer the questions of New Yorkers with uh, slick television ads or, or radio jingos. You have to be there and respond to questions and go and talk to uh, the students and to the workers and, and uh, the rest. And sometime, somewhere along the line, he's going to have to come out of the Rose Garden. And when he does, I hope to be there to be able to, so that's, uh, to enter into the discussion and the dialogue. That's one of the reasons why you say, I despite of, of what happens tomorrow, in spite of what might happen tomorrow, you're sticking with the rest. I think uh, the a vote by the people of New York for my candidacy will move Mr. Carter out of the White House, and then we get a real dialogue. And then people in, in uh, the other primaries will be able to make uh, some judgments about the future direction of the Democratic Party. Uh, and I think if the American people want a dialogue, they want a discussion, uh, they want debate, they want a testing of ideas, then they'll vote uh, for my candidacy because what it will do then is send a message that you can't really hide behind uh, the Rose Garden and not come out and explain the positions on it. Well, it's, it's interesting to perceive. I, I once said this on our show. I'm repeating myself. But last October, we tried to put together a program. And this was about the time you declared your candidacy, when you were up here in the polls and, and President Carter was down there. We couldn't get a single person in New York to come on the show to defend President Carter yeah. last October. We had to call the White House, and they had to send a special representative all the way to New York to do this. W really, all that's happened are events. Really, if you analyze what's happened, how long will it take for the public before the public recognizes that that has been what has changed their attitude toward him. That's right. This has nothing to do with you. That's right. Even if you were to withdraw yes. a candidacy. How long is it going to take before the voters see that? Well, I think it's, uh, it's happening, and it's happening uh, in New York, and it's happening across uh, uh, the, uh, the country. You see, I believe in the presidency as an institution that ought to establish some goals, establish for the country, uh, establish some vision for the country, be able to develop the team and, and then uh, work with the Congress of the United States and the American people to achieve uh, those goals. And that's what I'd like to do. I appreciate the chance I'm, to be with you I'm glad you today. could be with us, Senator. Thank much. you very nice much. To see you. Good luck tomorrow. Good. We'll be back right after this with Robert Strauss representing President Carter.